We're filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive in Scottsdale, Arizona. My name is Monk Rowe. I'm very pleased to have Shelley Berg with me at the festival. And you seem to be a guy who wears a lot of different hats. Is yeah, that a fair my, statement? Life, my life is about hats. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, educator, uh, doing a fair bit of composing and scoring, and traveling around and playing. And so, uh, yeah, it's a juggling act. Do you favor one over the other? It's an interesting uh, thing. I think when I look at myself in the mirror in the morning, I see a jazz piano player. You know, I think yeah. that that's how I define myself. But, you know, if you think of the playing, the teaching, and the scoring, um, maybe being the order of fulfillment, if you flip it upside down, that's the pay scale. <laughs> so uh, it's just one of those interesting things about life. What's on the top of the pay scale? Uh, there's a the scoring job in terms that, of the money for the per hours. Right? If you're doing a, for instance, if you're doing a network 30-second uh, spot for a commercial, you know, it may take you two hours to score the whole thing, and yet the pay can be a lot, oh, or wow. okay. working, doing an orchestration for a rock star or something like that, mm -hmm. per hour, that's probably the highest wow. in terms of pay of the things that I do. Great. We'll have to talk more about that. Um, at what point in your, in your young life, I guess, did it seem like music was going to be your thing? At my earliest recollection. Yeah. I mean, it, literally, no, my earliest okay. recollection is... Yeah that music was going to be my uh -huh. thing. I don't recall a time in my life ever that music wasn't going to be my thing. Uh, I started picking out tunes at the piano when I was a toddler. Yeah. And uh, my parents came in when I was about five one day, and I was playing Alley Cat with two hands. Ooh. And so they decided it was uh, time for lessons. So it's always been me. Oh, this, this begs a, a trivia question. You might be one of the few people who knows who the guy that recorded <laughs> Alley Cat is. Oh, no. <laughs> I wasn't able to read the liner okay. notes at that age. <laughs> well, all right. I'll tell you later. Okay. It's an interesting name. <laughs> but um, so they recognize your talent. Yeah. Did they uh, help you out in that regard? Yeah. My dad um, is an avocational jazz trumpet player, uh -huh. and he was also a classical French horn player. So the music was always around me. Um, there were always jam sessions at my house when I was a kid, and mm -hmm. if people were in off the road, they usually were ended up at our house for a jam session oh, and yeah. dinner. And so, uh, yeah, they were very encouraging. And, and where was home? At that time, it was Cleveland, Ohio. Uh huh. And I think by the time I was 10 or 11, my dad had pretty well scoped out that I was a potential live-in accompanist for his jazz oh. trumpet. Oh. So <laughs> okay, yeah. He was uh, bringing me along quickly. Uh huh. And it was great. Yeah. Do you recall the first time you played out? Oh yeah. Yeah. I was starting to play out um, doing sh um, shows and things when I was 10 or 11, um, doing little paid gigs, just um, kind of playing things that I'd worked out. And then uh, by the time I was 13, I was trying to go to jam sessions with my dad mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, getting kicked off the stand and, and uh, you know, they let me play a half of a tune or a tune and then say, oh, okay, yeah. now go, you know, no you're done. Yeah. But by the time I was uh, 15, you know, I was, I was in. At yeah. the jam sessions I was playing. Well, when did you make, or how did you make, the transition from just playing what was on the page to expanding that, to comping and all that? Or right. Well, when I was about 10 or 11, my dad, as I said, he was figuring out, you know, that this was somebody he may be able to play tunes with someday. Uh -huh. So he started showing me basic chords. And um, don't ask me why. The first tune he taught me was That's All. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's a bit of a challenge. Yeah, well, he taught me the first three chords, basically planing up um, from F well, minor, G minor, A minor, and just yeah. back down, you know. And I did that for a while. Then he taught me da 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 da. Uh -huh. So I, my mother must have gone crazy for about two weeks. I just played that, you know, up and down the piano, the first four bars of that's all, <laughs> until he finally taught me da 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 da. Buddha, and I got that on the chord, and that was the next couple of weeks. So it was a slow process, but you know, that was the beginning. Yeah. Uh, as I said, there was always music in the house. My dad, whenever he was home, there was always a record on. Uh, I had a big, huge collection, and so he was sitting me down with Art Tatum and Oscar Peterson and Bill Evans and Bud Powell and Red Garland and mm. Cannonball Adderley and Milt Jackson yeah. from an early age. And I mean, sitting me down and saying, listen to this, what are you hearing? And really just mentoring me along. Wow. And he still does. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> A music college was in your future 
from from that time on then? Yeah, I studied classical piano yeah. all my life and ended up with a master's degree in classical piano and conducting from University of Houston. Mm -hmm. And I still practice and I really um, try to teach all my jazz piano students to love classical music and understand what it can mean to them as pianists, well, as jazz pianists. You're in good company then because Roland Tanner just said the same thing. Really? Yeah. He talked about the importance of knowing, of being able to recognize what they did with harmonies and how they wrote for piano and all that kind of thing. Well, there's just so many thousands, endless kinds of sounds and colors you can get out of a piano and I think that working on classical literature is a really focused way to get to that. What mm -hmm. I notice with my students who don't work on classical music is their hands aren't very supple, especially their left hand. Uh -huh. uh, it kind of looks like a, a club and you want them to develop that beautiful suppleness to their hands and then you know that they have a freedom to, to really express themselves. Yeah. When did you first get into composing, arranging? Well, my first professional composing gig was when I was, uh, I think, 12. There was a synagogue in Cleveland that was opening a new, a new uh, sanctuary, and uh -huh. I got commissioned to compose a, uh, a piece for a youth orchestra to play at the opening. Wow. So once I figured out about transpositions, everything was fine. Yeah? <laughs> the first read-through was a little rough. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so, uh... You were into atonality all yeah, the Yeah, it was... <laughs> It was, uh, yeah, Schoenberg had nothing on me at that wow. point, <laughs> except for intention. But that must have been a, a monumental thing to do for a first orchestration, I would think, when you're 12. I, I think you don't know it's hard Oh, yet. okay. So um, I played a lot of classical piano, and I kind of had some Alberti textures and boom chuck chuck kind of textures yeah. from the pieces that I played, and I think I was just emulating uh -huh. kind of okay. what I knew. And yeah. Wrote a nice little Jewish sounding theme, at least uh -huh. it seemed like to me. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Does that score still exist? Yes, it does. All right. In, in all of its pencil written glory. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and how do you write now? Do you use the technology same. the same? <laughs> uh, I have a MIDI studio in Hollywood. Yeah. And I use Finale and I use sequencing and sample. Yeah. Uh, you know, all the gear. But when it comes to orchestrating, it's me at a table with a score, pencil in my hand. And uh, the best way I can describe it is is orchestrating or composing for orchestra is kind of d you descend into a world where you can hear everything. I think at its best, you don't want to be at a piano, you don't want to be mm. hearing it back on a synthesizer. It takes 15, 20 minutes at least to decompress yourself down into that world when suddenly you're hearing everything. And then once you're in that space, hopefully the phone doesn't ring. I was and, just going to uh, say, you have to isolate yourself pretty right. well. To and that's how I write. And I can write really quickly once I get to that place because mm. then the piece kind of happens. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting feeling. Yeah. Do you think the, the tools that are available today, um, oh, how should I say this, don't foster that kind of ability? It's a concern. Um, it's great in that you can immediately hear, in terms of trial and error and learning to hear, getting to hear back what you've written. It's a great tool, with the caveat that you're not really hearing back what you've written. Uh -huh. And chances are it may sound a whole lot better or a whole lot worse in a real environment. So um, there's certainly some use to it. I find in the industry now everybody wants a full demo of any orchestra piece you write. And you can get it to sound so good that they think it's what it's going to sound like, and if it, and yet it isn't, and that's a real worry there because they they might not quite get it from the demo, and yet it sounds convincing enough that they think they're hearing the real thing. So it, it, it's fraught with <laughs> with its pitfalls. Uh -huh. but, but yeah, that I think that, that you know there was an interesting column in Jazz. I think it was in Jazz Times a couple of years ago, and what it said I agree with, and basically it said that technology makes it possible for everyone to create the atmosphere of great music. Ooh. You can put on your Will Lee bass loop and your Peter Erskine drum loop and lock up the BPM and, you, and you've got that and then you, you've got the greatest sampled sounds and this and that and the other and you, you can, you know, basically putting something together that the sounds sonically are first rate. 
Mm -hmm. it doesn't, that doesn't even begin to speak to what you are as a composer or what yeah. aptitude you have for that. But you've now created the atmosphere that you're doing it. And I guess the same could be said in graphics with computer graphics and all those kinds of things. There's between an artist who can really draw something and somebody who can just merge a bunch of stuff off of a computer program. So in some ways, an, in an interesting dichotomy has happened. With the explosion of media kinds of outlets, there's much more opportunity as a composer, but there's also much, much more competition from people who 20 years ago could never have been in this business. Mm -hmm. And it becomes mm -hmm. hard to separate them out. That's true. If you go and you search uh, CD now, and you know everyone has a website, and it, which you can say is, is a good thing because everyone has the opportunity. But how do you find out who belongs there? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, in a sense, you, the the people who were in it before this technological explosion can tend to feel a little threatened. Mm -hmm. You know unless they keep up with it. And it's difficult to keep up with it. They, yeah. If you buy the, the right magazines, what it tells you every week is that you're behind now. <laughs> <laughs> buy this, and, and you'll hopeless. be behind next week. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's hopeless. <laughs> wow. So, but, you know, every time I sit down at a piano, it's a technology that hasn't changed in a yeah. long time. Yeah. And it's still revealing new things to me every day. Uh -huh. Interesting. And these kind of situations probably reveal new things too, playing with any combination of people, you know. It's fascinating, um, and I think some really great energies can happen. You know, some people, if they're traveling with their own bands, lament, well, it's all going to be a jam session, but it's a very special kind of a jam session at a festival like this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, already today some really amazing things have happened. Yeah. So I love it. Right. It doesn't look like anybody's out to make anybody else look bad. No, you know, that's like not... there's a group thing. That's not the vibe here at all. As a matter of fact, everybody's very encouraging. When I played my first solo today and Herb Hellas went like this, I thought, okay, oh, right. that made my year. I'm in. <laughs> he was either very angry or he dug <laughs> yeah, trying right. to figure that out. But, yeah. Right. Um, no, everybody's pulling for everybody here uh -huh. and trying to, you know, certainly as a rhythm section player, right. my job is to, you know, I, I say that what, my, what I do is kind of like the background to a painting, and if the foreground is the soloist, so if, mm -hmm. if the soloist is the pope, I try not to be hell, you know? <laughs> it's okay. So I try to be a background that really puts it in its best light, yeah. and so I, I think everybody in the rhythm sections is uh -huh. working with that in mind. It certainly sounds that way to right. me. Uh, would you consider a f some years as dues-paying years in, in your career so far? They've all been dues-paying. Okay, they all are, and they probably will remain in way. some ways, I, you know, I think if you talk to a hundred people, you'll have a hundred different paths to getting mm -hmm. where they are. Um, I got married on my 19th birthday the first time yeah. and worked my way through college, had a couple of kids by the time I graduated, mm. Play, worked my way playing six nights a week, top 40 in country music, yeah. graduated college and took a job teaching at a, at a community college so that I could get out of working every night and uh, had a wedding reception band. And so... I couldn't afford to take very many jazz gigs because I could make more money sure. with the wedding reception band. So that was a lot of deuce paying. I learned a lot, and I love music, so I always enjoyed it. Um, but it wasn't really till I moved to L.A. nine years ago that I started becoming seriously a jazz piano player. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was precipitated by Bill Watrous, who came and was the guest artist in the late 80s at the community college where I taught All in right. Texas. And... Uh, the students were saying, oh, Mr. Watchers, you should, you should hear Mr. Berg, our director, play. And so yeah. on the concert, he said, you got to play. And I said, no, nah, this is about the students. And he said, no, no, just one song. Just play with me. So I did, and then he hired me. Oh, gosh. So um, he really encouraged me to, to move to Los Angeles. And my kids were getting older, and life was changing. And so these yeah. last nine years, I've started to really be a jazz piano player. Yeah. Well, that's great. He's a nice guy. He's been a great yeah. and true friend yeah. and mentor. Uh -huh. uh, you mentioned writing for Hollywood and uh, the studios. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Is there a is, is, do you need to meet people? Is there a way like <laughs> my my standard line is it's a business of relationships, you know, yeah. and all it takes is one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it, 
it, that's another interesting thing is, to, is when you read interviews of film composers. Well, I was playing in some rock band, and so and so became a fan, and you know, I did their student film, and then they made it. And I mean, it's oh. it, it's never. I graduated from film scoring school and made okay. phone calls, and I got hired, uh -huh. you know, or they came in and recruited me like lawyers. You know, it just right. it's totally relationships. Every cool job I've ever gotten has been from some convoluted path. Mm -hmm. And what I encourage my students to do, and people I talk to, is just. Be out there, be a musician, be playing, be where you can meet people, because you never know what's going to lead to what. You know, I, I orchestrated an album for the pop band Chicago, because the co-leader, Jim Pankow, is a trombone player and is a big Bill Watchers fan and always came out to hear the band. Oh my. And heard the orchestrations I did with Bill and said, we're going to do an album with a big band and I want you to write all the charts. And I'm going, sure, like this will really happen. And it did. Uh huh. So. It's definitely a business of relationships. The, um, some of the movie things I've done have come from rock things I've done, and the same rock producers have gotten involved in the movie industry, and I've gotten in mm -hmm. kind of that way. So um, that's how it goes. There's no, yeah. there's no path. Is it a high-pressure situation, writing for films? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, I had to orchestrate an hour's worth of music for a Warner Brothers film in about two weeks, mm. all while I'm teaching and playing and doing all the other oh. stuff I do. And, you know, it's just totally under the gun. And uh, then it, the release gets delayed by a year. <laughs> and you wonder what all that was about. Um, I think that the bigger the medium, actually, the less the pressure in some ways. The most pressure is in commercials, in that little 30-second spot. Uh -huh. I think advertising agencies, um, agencies rent offices and hire staff just for that one client and if they lose that client the bottom drops oh out. So tremendously charged and they try to um, disperse that pressure to everyone they work with and then television seems to be next and then movies once people have made it to that level it seems like there's they have more of a comfort level with what they're doing and uh, it, for me it, it actually seemed you were a little less second guessed in movies than you are in television and a lot less than you are in commercial world uh -huh. so it's interesting are but in all those things, you're, you're dealing with people who, who um, probably are sticking their nose a little farther into your thing than what they have any business. Well, you just anticipated my <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, because you're usually dealing with non-musicians um, when you're doing commercials. And right. Do you have trouble trying to bring to reality what they're describing to you? Sometimes. You can think you're right on the wavelength and mm -hmm. you're totally wrong. Uh, I, it's gotten to where sometimes I just say, can you give me an example of something uh -huh. that's what you mean? Because they can say something and it's, and the words that they're using evoke a certain thing, but it's really the opposite of what they want. Wow. There's a famous film scoring story um, of a well-known composer who the director said for this one cue, you know, give me Debussy, I want Debussy. So, yeah. that, have you heard this one? No, I have not. It's a not, true story. It sounds... He gets on the scoring stage and he's got La Mer, you know, yeah. nailed, and it's gorgeous, and the textures, and the 12 cellos with five different parts, you know, and he finishes, and the orchestra's all tapping their bows, and the director walks out and looks at him and says, You know, I hate it. I just hate it. So, at that point, the director said, I want my mother, I think was the quote, that's what he said. I, I want my mom. But the, he got with the director and, uh, um, what the composer found out was that the director really wanted Mozart. He just threw out the first classical name he could think of, which was Debussy, but the sound he had in mind was Mozart. <laughs> it's all the same thing, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> so the, the, the second TV series that I wrote for, I did a, a children's series for two years on, on ABC, and the very first episode, there was a turtle in the episode. The kid in the uh -huh. show had a pet, and I wrote this little piece of music and producer comes in and I thought she was joking she said you know that music's not quite working it's you've written land turtle music and that's really an aquatic turtle <laughs> she was joking I said well you had it in a terrarium you know you faked me out here I thought yeah. it was a land turtle <laughs> she was serious you know I had to change the music and oh my. somehow figure out what she meant by uh -huh. water turtle music so wow. it's really fascinating to watch the trends that uh, commercials seem to jump on, like I've been noticing lately a, a lot of commercials that are have a female vocalist that imitating Sheryl Crow. 
Mm -hmm. And this seems to be the hot thing. And I wonder how long that'll last and until something else comes well, up. Well, it's because one of them worked, you know, and that's yeah. the big thing in the, in the media these days. If anything that works, let's just do that because it's already, it's proved itself. Uh -huh. And it can be frustrating when you're composing because it puts you in a very narrow box. Yeah. So, but it's a gig. Yes, yeah, it's a gig. <laughs> uh, drop some names on me. What are some of the rock bands you've, um, you do Chicago? Well, you know, I'm so pleased that I got a Grammy nomination for working with Kiss. <laughs> oh my, is that right? <laughs> Played piano and orchestrated for Kiss uh -huh. on their uh, recent Psycho Circus album. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Gene Simmons actually is an interesting guy. And When uh, we were working with him, I have a writing partner, and we asked him, how are the rehearsals going for the tour? He said, what does it matter? He said, we can suck and 50,000 people will come to every concert. Oh. So the problem with you jazz musicians is you want to play good for $75. <laughs> great quote. Thank you, Gene. I worked with Richard Marks on a couple uh -huh. albums, who's a great pop star. Yeah. I worked on an album uh, for a guy named Elliot Smith that uh, Billboard magazine named the number two album of the year last year. It was mm -hmm. a, a really great alternative songwriter. So you never know. I mean, I've worked with Mickey Gilly in country music. I, yeah. I've, I've kind of worked with a wide variety. There's some Japanese. I do a lot of work for Japanese superstars and they've got a whole sound and I love that because this uh, one guy I work with typically uses 80 and 90 piece orchestras oh on my God. Japanese rock tunes. So wow. It's like doing a film score. Do you usually get the assignment um, musically after the fact, after they've laid down most of the tune and then, okay, now what can you do right. with this? Typically, that's true. Um, depending. I mean, obviously, if you're doing a, a scoring thing, then you're wide open. But yeah. when you're working with rock bands, typically, they've laid down tracks, and, and then it's your job to come in. So it's an interesting kind of a straitjacket, and yet you're still trying to create I, something. I would guess, and uh, sometimes it must be a challenge, too. How can anything be put over this? I would, that would be my sense. Like, Especially when it's heavy metal and heavy, we want to yeah, add a 90-piece orchestra. Yeah, there's so much going on and, well. <laughs> it's a, okay, it, it's, it's a another one of those challenges. And uh, One time this uh, Japanese guy that I work with um, had a kind of a power metal ballad thing. And he said, I'd like to do an alternate version with, with just the lead vocal and 50 strings and write whatever you want. And so now all I had was a lead vocal. I wasn't married to the chord progression. Wow. And there was even about a 12 or 16 bar guitar solo in the middle where now there was nothing. And I wrote like for Clarta Nacht, you know, Schoenberg, <laughs> for those 16 bars. And the guy loved it and he released that instead of the original oh, version right. with totally different harmonies and it went to number one in Japan. So oh. that was about the one time I ever got a clean plate. Wow. <laughs> Do you do all your own uh, mm, business as far as contracts and all that kind of thing? Yeah, I have a partner, and, yeah. and he kind of manages the business of the office. Yeah. So I'm not having to fill out too many contracts right. or copy any parts or right. hire mm -hmm. players. So it works out well because he's a great musician too, but he's also willing to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I get tired thinking about your schedule, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I am the chair of music. At, yeah, <laughs> chair of jazz music in the Thornton School at U University of Southern California, and that's uh -huh. kind of a full-time job too. So, yeah. but that's a great job. I love it. Okay. We have wonderful students and an incredible faculty. It's a real who's who. Well, you you must have an answer for for people who say you can't teach jazz. I definitely have an answer okay. for that. You can teach jazz. You must. We must teach you jazz. Must. must. Okay. Um, you can't teach talent. There's no question about that. But you can teach jazz. And it's, you know, what we've discovered is it's a language. Uh -huh. It's a language. And the way to teach a language is on different levels at the same time. You wouldn't want to take a language just out of a textbook. You wouldn't want to just learn it conversationally and not be literate in it. So the great thing about a university is it's an environment where if it's done well, you can really do both you can mentor on that kind of visceral conversational level 
and you can also then come in after the fact and teach the literacy, which I think is important. Uh, by that, do you mean uh, teaching some amount of learning the craft by ear and, and by gut, mm -hmm. and then following that up, or at the same time teaching? It can be at the same the time. Craft. It's it's better when you follow it up. Uh huh. I think that's the way we learn to speak. You know, we were talking for a long time before we were diagramming sentences. Well, that's, I, I really like that idea. And, and especially, I mean, because I've seen other instances where, where people try to um, do it the opposite way, teaching all the vocabulary, the chord structure, the, the scales and everything, and then trying to apply it. And I don't know if it works. I think it's, it can be overload. Uh -huh. You've got all this information. And you just feel, okay, I have this information. What in the world am I supposed to be doing with this? It means nothing to me if my students can write every seventh to third resolution for every chord change, but then you play a chord and say, sing the seventh to third, and they can't hear it. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather they could sing the seventh to third even if they didn't know how to write it just yet. Okay. And find it on their horn and learn to play it and learn not only how to play it, but how does it feel? How's the tension release of that feel? Uh -huh. What's the feeling you get by holding the seventh? What's the feeling you get by releasing it to the third? How can you work with that? How can you play with that? How can you, how can you create something with that? Mm. And then we'll get around to <laughs> analyzing it so maybe you can use it as a writer, use it in other situations, uh -huh. use it more fully, figure out other things that go with it. Yeah. So I think that's what we're trying to do where I teach and in a lot of places. Yeah. So everybody and your faculty seem to share that basic philosophy. We have, we have a lot of different philosophies, but the thing is the sum total of that ends up being that philosophy. Uh -huh. So we have John Clayton, the world-class bassist and composer, who says to his students, burn your fake books. I never want to see a fake book in your presence. I want you to go out on the gigs and just use your ear and learn to hear, and I don't want you to know what the changes are. I just want you to be able to sing them and be able to find them. And that's a crash course in developing your ear. And on the other side, we have Tom Mason, who's a brilliant jazz pedagogue, who's ripping it apart and analyzing it for the students. Uh -huh. The compositors, they get, they get the whole thing. Yeah. What's the future for those graduates? Well, that's the million dollar question. Um, I'm glad I teach in LA, in yeah. Los Angeles, because I think there's a lot of opportunity for my students. And I've got a brilliant jazz piano student who got his master's degree who's touring with Christina Aguilera right now. Mm -hmm. And another brilliant jazz piano student who's touring with Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. Okay. And another one who's recording with Anthony Wilson and, Mul and uh, Ronald Muldrew and a bunch of guys like that, and he's making it in a hardcore jazz scene. Right. Three of my recent graduates. So I think that I think it's important to realize that there's a big world of music out there and become the best musician that you can be. And if you're a great jazz musician, you're the best musician you can be. Uh -huh. And um, don't shun any opportunities. Don't shun the chance to do something that's a little outside the box for uh -huh. jazz because you know, I, I, tr I think I'm living proof. I have a wonderful career in music, and I get to play great music also in times like this. Yeah. So I think I get the best of all the worlds. But um, so few are going to make it to that pinnacle where they can make their living all the time exclusively playing their instrument in jazz. Mm -hmm. So our methodology at USC is to help them see that there is a future. and. If, when they're in a place like LA, it acts upon them and they start to get it in ways that I could never explain to them. So it's fun. I hear from my former students and the, we always have a talk their senior year where they have this look of panic of what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. And they, they seek me out, they come to my office, now what? And I always tell them, give them a little advice, talk to them, but I say basically I'm going to see you a year after you graduate and you'll be well into what you're doing. And it invariably is the case. I, mm -hmm. They come back a year after they graduate and they're into whatever it is. And some good percentage of them are mostly playing and mostly playing jazz. Uh -huh. But a lot of them have just found other things yeah. and, and they still play their jazz. Like I do. Right. I'm not on the road right. every week just playing jazz. I suppose I'd like to be, maybe. I, yeah, I guess you've got to be careful what you wish for. Yeah. <laughs> but I can see at some point in my life doing that.
I can see your partner calling you up and saying, did you wish for something last week because the phone stopped ringing? Now what's yeah, exactly. going on here? <laughs> well, I'd be even more careful about wishing for doing that full time. Yeah. Because then I couldn't play at all. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, I like, I like what you just said basically about students um, having to be versatile or having to have the kind of mindset where they're willing to be versatile. Um, because if you said uh, there's opportunities out there, but they might not always be in that specific niche that the student thought. Right. And I'll talk to a young, talented student, and they're out there, a tenor player, and he'll say, well, I'm going to go to New York because I know there's a lot of great players out of there, but, but I'm going to rise to the top. I'm going to be the one that makes it. And you don't want to raid on their parade because <laughs> they might. But I find it easy enough to say, you know, there's only one Joshua Redman, and he's smart enough to have a degree from Harvard. Uh. Isn't it nice to have someone you can pull on? <laughs> Make that example. Yeah. You know, but how many other people are in that world where they can just, young player, make their living playing jazz? Mm -hmm. I hope it'll be more and more. I hope that, that there are kinds of music that, ha that enjoy a ubiquity and yet they're obscure at the same time, and jazz is that way. It's everywhere, and yet people aren't necessarily paying for it. Interesting. Yeah. And you look at the audience that's here, and I mean, these people are so into it, yet they're all up there in age. Mm -hmm. And you're going to wonder, like, are there going to be replacements? I don't worry about that so much, because what symphony orchestras discovered, they start, they worried about that, too, that the audience is getting older and they're going to just be disappear. And what they discovered is that it's not, you know, that it's just this group of people in that age group. As people move into that age group, their tastes change. So it's always going to be a lot of people in that age group that gravitate mm -hmm. towards that, towards those more artistic kinds of music. But I don't think that that's the total answer. I would like to see a younger demographic yeah. for jazz. I play at a jazz club in LA that is families and young people and college kids, and it's straight ahead jazz, and the place is packed every night. And so hmm. that's a hopeful sign. Yeah. Um, but if we can find a way to make people aware that that thing that's all around them, that jazz thing, is, a, is something that they can be consumers of, we can do a lot better. And I think, you know, I was president of the International Association of Jazz Educators for two years. Mm -hmm. And that's an organization that's dedicated to building a new jazz audience from the ground up. And the idea is if we can get in and teach the teachers, teach the general music teachers who, are, right. who never had jazz in college to love jazz and expose our students to it. We've started an artist outreach network when I was with IAJE to get the labels where you've got these guys on tour, let's get them into elementary schools. Let's get Michael Brecker showing a kid what a saxophone sounds like and try to get those values imprinted early. Right. We, can, we can build a bigger niche for jazz. Mm -hmm. And I, the jazz industry is getting smarter. They've been, you know, country music really took off when they started the CMA and they had their own advocacy group that all the labels paid into oh. and they started the country music awards and they created a higher profile and then country really took off and became a much bigger piece of the market well jazz is now starting to do the same thing and it's in its infancy but but that has now an organization like that has begun with label support and who knows maybe over the next ten years that group will do in some small measure what CMA did for country music so be nice. could be better maybe I'll have more gigs and my yeah. students will have more gigs and there'll be more audi audience. Right. You don't uh, see too much jazz in the video format on TV. Right. I suppose that would help too. I, in a sense, I, I wish it wasn't necessary because I, th I think jazz is, is enough for your imagination. Mm -hmm. But I suppose you have to do whatever you can. Yeah, you have to play the hand that's dealt. And yeah. You can't ignore the habits of a generation. Mm -hmm. We can't turn a blind eye to the way that they're going to receive and are receiving their entertainment. Right. So there has to be a changeover into that. We, we must have jazz videos. And I think BET is trying to accomplish that in some way with their Bet on Jazz channel. Mm -hmm. So pieces are there. You know, it, the, there's, a, there's an infrastructure that's in place. It just remains to be seen what's going to be done with it. Yeah. It's improving. I can feel that. Uh -huh. I think that there's a, there's a greater awareness of jazz, and we're starting to see jazz as an, as an accoutrement to a lifestyle. 
that mm. if you're a little more sophisticated, maybe you're out of your 20-something thing and, and you know, you enjoy a good glass of port and, you know, this kind of thing, <laughs> yeah. well, there's jazz there. And you're starting to see that, and I think that certainly uh, s speaks to the appeal of a Diana Krall and some, you know, yeah. she sold over a million CDs. Yeah. Well, that means that there's some demographic now that's significant that is accepting this as a part of their right. lifestyle. I, th I think of John Pizzarelli mm -hmm. in, that, in that vein, you know, right. he's, he's found a niche there, I think. And, um, yeah, and there's a whole hipster thing starting to happen with um, um, Kurt Elling, Patricia Barber, mm -hmm. people like that, that this melding of a kind of a hipster appearance, the Hollywood kind of swingers look yeah. uh, with jazz that also could be an interesting trend for us. Mm -hmm. Who are the jazz musicians that uh, you aspire to or you just thought that these are the guys, man? It's a long list. Yeah. Um, at the center of it all for me growing up was Oscar Peterson. Uh -huh. uh, that's why it was so gratifying to do this album with Ray Brown and Ed Thigpen, my Oscar <laughs> Peterson tribute album, um, because that was, that was the motivation. And there was a time I was even going back and forth, classical music, jazz music, what do I want to do? And in one kind of astounding week, Vladimir Horowitz came out of one of his retirements and played in Houston where I was living. And Oscar Peterson came through and did a solo recital in the same hall. And I left the Vladimir Horowitz concert so enthused about practicing and so excited. But I left the Oscar Peterson concert saying, that's what I want to be. And I was about 17 at the time. That's when it really hit home that this I'm going to be a jazz musician, and I'll always love my classical music, but this is it. But growing up, my dad exposed me to a lot. He had all the original 78, Savoy and Dial, all the Charlie Parker and Lucky mm -hmm. Thompson, and all the, those great Don Bias and Coleman Hawkins, Body and Soul. He had all that stuff on 78s. And, um, he, my dad's a trumpet player, so he had uh, probably every Miles Davis album. Um, and he was, he was giving me big dosages of Oscar Peterson and, and uh, Art Tatum. But I grew, I, I think to this day, maybe my favorite player in history is Cannonball Adderley. I'm just looking at Tim because he knows that Cannonball is my guy. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about Cannonball Adderley. <laughs> let's talk about Cannonball. Let's forget all those yeah. other guys. Milt Jackson's way up there, well, too. Well, I'm just so pleased you said that because <laughs> that's how I feel, too. But I'm wondering why. And oh, I know there, why. Is there a, okay, well. I know why. Um, because he's the perfect culmination of every attribute. Um, impeccable technique, impeccable time, as sophisticated harmonically and melodically as anybody of his day, and yet so incredibly soulful and bluesy. And you put all those things together, and there's just no other player for me that's ever synergized all those things so well. And, you know, nobody's ever swung any more than that. I like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> well said. I feel the same exact way. I'm a saxophone player, so he just like, you know, he had it all. He had the tone. It was so vibrant and, yep. and uplifting. Yep. You know? Oh, absolutely. And, and then I put on top of the fact uh, that he could talk to people. Absolutely know, so. Which not everybody can. He was a school teacher. Yeah. And uh, had his own talk show at a time when there weren't many African Americans that had network talk shows. Yes. I got to get a copy of those things. I wonder if they exist. I think Roy McCurdy, who I play with a fair bit in Los uh -huh. Angeles, has quite a few of those oh, things. So okay. he'd be a guy right. to check Thanks with. Because he played for that show <laughs> and talks about it. Okay. Quite a bit. All right. So I'll be giving Roy a call. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that until a while ago. Someone else told me that. I was very fascinated by that. But yeah. You know the band he had in the in the '60s with with Joe Zavinul and I mean that's it. Well, we have uh, some of those CDs on both my uh, Julia, my wife, and I in our cars. We have Cannonball CDs in both our cars right now from that era, so that wherever yeah. we're going, we can always get right to it. You Isn't know. That great. I love the Nancy Wilson Cannonball. <laughs> that's the one album I, you know, you do the thing about, well, if you're going to be on the beach, <laughs> right. that's on my list. Yeah, if we're going to be on the desert island. Isn't it curious that, did you, you know, if you buy the CD of that, they 
rearrange the tunes, mm -hmm. and you'll find it very annoying. Mm -hmm. Because on the album they have instrumental, vocal, instrumental. Right. Well, what they did on the CD is they put all the instru vocals, and then they put all the instruments. It sounds like two different CDs. Yeah, and it's like you get you get so used to hearing the one tune end, and you know what the key's going to be for the next. Right. And I have to program it to put it back where it used to be. <laughs> but that is great. Well, I'm, 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 you have good taste. <laughs> well, likewise. Yeah. <laughs> what's um, what's on the docket for you in the in the uh, very near future, writing assignments? Um, yeah, I'm uh, doing some some writing. I just I just uh, wrapped up a couple of cool television projects. We did the Dennis Miller Millennium Special, which was a blast. Uh huh. I did a Korean movie. And <laughs> wow. <laughs> so uh, you never know. I mean, it's uh, you never know what, what the phone's going to ring. And so I've got some more of the Japanese rock things to do. And I'm doing a project project with an opera singer who wants to do some an orchestral album of uh, mm -hmm. songs. And so it's just, you know, if the doors open, interesting things come in. But I don't really gauge my life on the writing projects, you know. I, to me, it's what's coming up, you know. I'm getting to play the Norway Jazz Cruise with my trio. So that's, oh, great. Great. that's what's exciting for me. And yeah. I'm going to be working on my next CD this summer. And there's three singers that I work with that were all wonderful who I'm doing CDs with this summer as well. So, And hopefully Bill Watrous and I will be doing another album soon. So. I hope to be in the studio playing lots of jazz over the next six or seven months. Wow. You, you must have a couple different calendars to make sure that you're in the right place at the right time it's, uh, with the right hat on. It's the hardest part. Yeah. It's, it's really the hardest part. Yeah. Is, um, you don't want to end up with a feeling that you're not quite nailing it, not quite taking care of business for the university or for the writing office or for the playing or for the mm -hmm. family. Um, right. So that's really the hardest part because I don't. I don't want to disappoint in any of those areas. Right. So, constantly trying to figure out that balance. But do you have any non-musical hobbies or anything? Non I ask that hobbies. because I don't, and I just wondered if, if, if there's something that gets you out of that. See, there's nothing that's more refreshing to me than to practice the piano. Okay. So whatever I've been doing. The best diversion would be to sit down and play. Um, I do work out. I like to exercise. I think to do what I do and do it well, it's a good idea to be in pretty good shape. Uh -huh. um, and if I get a chance to, you know, play some softball or throw a football around, I'm, yeah. I love sports. But, uh -huh. but, you know, I haven't played golf in 17 years. I think. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine spending four hours doing anything. If I had those hours, I should be at the piano. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't live with myself. Right. So. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any regular hobby. Um, I'm, I'm lucky in that what I love to do best is what I do. Wow, that good statement. It's, it's um, you know, people ask sometimes, like, when do you know you've made it? You know, but if you're doing what you love and being fairly successful at it, or, that better be the only gauge. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're, you're chasing something that's. Uh -huh. That doesn't have any definition. Yeah. Um, because even if you've made it in other people's eyes, it may not have been the way that you intended to, and so it feels like you missed the mark somehow. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try not to not to ponder when and if I'll ever make it. Yeah. <laughs> Great. If I can play a nice chorus of Cherokee, I've made it for that day. Yeah. <laughs> you get one of these from Herb Ellis. Right. That was. I, I made it today. <laughs> that was one form. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to put on just a bit of this. Was this with um, the Watrous big band? Yes. Yeah. Um, I tried to um, do something from m many different Oscar Peterson projects that I loved, and one he did. Uh, album called Busting Out with the Ernie Wilkins Big Band, mm -hmm. which was a great album. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun to do one big band cut? So I wrote this piece that's the title of the album based on the Gene Lee's book, The Will to Swing. Uh -huh. So this piece is The Will. Great. great. And uh, I play with Bill's Big Band, and I know that it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. So yeah. they came in and walked in, and 30 minutes later they walked out, and we had an incredible uh, piece of music. Does that flip you out or what? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. We had two takes, actually. Uh huh. And I could have used either one. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. 
That's the cats. Well, this has really been fascinating. It's a I, I, I appreciate you coming down and uh, adding to our our little archive here of information because I think you had some really good outlooks on things that I haven't had before. I'm honored to be a part of it. Oh, great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.